Thanksgiving section, or is that in the... Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I, I know most of you, but for those of you that I don't know, my name is Eric Hungerford, and I am honored and delighted to welcome you to St. Paul's uh, on this blizzard of a morning. So thank you all for braving this crazy weather. Yesterday, I was telling Greg, who, Greg got in um, from Texas at was it 3 a.m. Uh, this morning? Uh, because his flight was delayed, and uh, what, it's probably 90 degrees in Texas by now, right? Summer has begun in Texas, so uh, <laughs> this was very exciting to him. Uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, welcome you to this, our very first film in our film series, our Lenten film series. And uh, uh, this film is... Uh, a film about James Baldwin entitled I Am Not Your Negro. And this is uh, very exciting because Greg is currently working on a book about James Baldwin, and he's just announced that Orbis Publishing has picked up this book. And so we're uh, really excited uh, uh, that he is able to shepherd us through this conversation today. Uh, let's see. I had a... A little note card with some notes here. Um, so j just a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, for those of you who don't know, if you would like, if you, if you need to use the restroom, there are restrooms just across the Port Cochere uh, in Dixon House. If you don't want to brave the, <laughs> the breezeway, uh, you can go up through the ambulatory and take a left in the hallway, and then the, the restroom is all the way at the end of the hall on the left. So uh, the other piece of the puzzle is that our own George McNeely has, has offered to provide lunch for us. So we want to mention that those of you who are with us today, come on in. Welcome, welcome. Uh, we, there will be sandwiches from Weaver's Way, and so uh, we will be picking those up about halfway through the film, and if you would like to uh, have a sandwich at your chair, you're welcome to do that, um, and, or if you'd like to wait until after uh, the film and the discussion, you're welcome to do that as well. It's just um, you know, kind of what your comfort level is. And um, I'd also like to welcome those of you that are joining us online. There, I have uh, some instructions for you. A couple of things uh, that I want to say. Firstly, you won't be able to watch the film synchronously with us via Zoom. But if you have Netflix, you can watch the film on Netflix this morning. And then you can join us after the film on Zoom for our discussion and chat will be enabled for you. So if you'd like to ask questions, feel free to chat. I'll be monitoring your questions and I can <clears throat> read those questions out loud for the group and for Greg. So thank you for joining us online and um, <clears throat> I'm sure you all are nice and cozy in your, in your PJs. Uh, and so, <laughs> so um, we are uh, delighted that you can be with us virtually. Um, so, without further ado, uh, and and I'll oh, and since he has just arrived, I also would like to thank Jarrett Kerbel, who is the rector of St. Martin in the Fields Parish, which is our other Episcopal church here in Chestnut Hill. And uh, we are very thankful, Jarrett, that um, that you uh, were willing to partner in this endeavor. And thank you for being here and for announcing it to all of your good folks over there. And so uh, welcome to all of the wonderful St. Martin's folks who are joining us online as well. Um, 
So, without further ado, I, I would like to say a few words about Greg Garrett. He is the, a professor of English at Baylor University. Um, he is the canon theologian at the American Cathedral in Paris. He has co-written a book with Rowan Williams. I was telling Greg this morning that he is one of the most prolific and uh, uh, amazingly varied subject matter authors that I have ever uh, met. And um, because I know Greg, I know a famous person. So, uh, so he, he's, uh, <laughs> he's, he's written novels, he's written works of theology, uh, he uh, is, is currently writing uh, a book about race, racist mythologies for Oxford University Press, and he, again, is writing this book about James Baldwin for Orbis Press. Um, he's working on another novel. He, uh, so uh, I th he's working on a TV series. So um, Greg is, is an extraordinary person. I had the very good fortune of getting to know Greg when he was a professor at my seminary in Austin. And um, so, um, you know, it's always great to be able to rub shoulders with greatness. And uh, <laughs> so thank you, Greg, for, for being here. Thank you for braving this weather. Thank you for um, putting up with arriving uh, at 3 a.m. this morning. Oh, you're so very and, welcome. Uh, really looking forward to this. So um, let's uh, all give Greg a, a very hearty round of applause. And, uh, And, and before Greg begins, uh, he has asked me to open us with the, the collect for social service. So I'd like for us to, to begin with prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, whose blessed Son came not to be served, but to serve, bless all who, following in his steps, give themselves to the service of others, that with wisdom, patience, and courage, they may minister in his name to the suffering, the friendless, and the needy, for the love of him who laid down his life for us, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Greg? Eric, thank you so much. Um, I, and I want to thank all of you for coming out uh, today. As you probably know, if you know anybody from Texas, this... Um, this weather would have paralyzed my hometown of Austin. Um, there would have been runs on the stores. There would be no toilet paper anywhere. Um, so it, it is incredible to uh, see much of your faces. Um, and uh, I am so grateful to you for coming out and grateful to those who are tuning in um, at home, as it were, um, and those who will be watching this later. So it, it is really a joy to welcome you to this first of the Lenten series on race and film. And I'm delighted to uh, be a part of this and to help to kick this off. Uh, this is work that I've been doing for about seven years now, uh, bringing uh, films on race into sacred spaces and, and helping to moderate conversations around them. And um, the first time that I did this with that was actually with a, a church uh, just across the way in Delaware, uh, where the rector invited me in. He was part of a, uh, a community that had been formed when a failing white church and a thriving black church had been put together uh, in inner city Dover. And uh, they had been together for 10 years. And he said, you know, we, we worship beautifully and we do work uh, in the community beautifully, but we've never been able to have hard conversations uh, about who we are and where we come from. And um, it was his great idea. Uh, whenever somebody says, hey, this is a great idea, I'm quick to say, yes, it is a great idea, but it's not my great idea. Um, you all know that when we share stories with someone, whether it's a novel or um, a film or a gospel lesson, then all of a sudden we are part of the same uh, realm of, of knowledge and experience. We've, we've uh, gone through something together. And one of the metaphors that's used in this film today is that metaphor of journey. Whenever we experience a story together, we go on a journey together. And we're able to reflect on that journey and to think a little bit about who we are and where we are and what we're called to do. And that's one of the things that I, I think that this movie today will allow us to do, is to share that journey together and to have some conversation about who we are, where we are, and what we're called to do. So, 
in, in this short introduction before we start the film, and again to folks who are watching uh, at home and who want to share this experience, uh, as Eric pointed out, you should be able to stream the film on Netflix or on Amazon. Um, and uh, the simple fact, of course, is that we don't have a broadcast license, which is what we would actually be doing if we zoomed this out into the world, and there would be legal consequences. <laughs> Nobody wants that uh, here in Chestnut Hill. So, um, we will be uh, cutting off the feed, I believe, for the, the 94 minutes of the runtime of the film, and then we'll come back together. So I, I want to give you a little bit of guidance about film watching, those of you here and those at home. Uh, I've been teaching film for about 35 years now, and I'm starting to get the hang of it a little bit. Uh, one of the things that I always try and remind people is that we have gotten very bad at watching films, and I think particularly bad over the last couple of years. Um, so we tend to watch omnivorously now. We watch on all sorts of devices, some of them with tiny, tiny screens. We tend to interrupt our viewing or pay less than full attention to what we're doing uh, because those are the lives that we live right now. And uh, so what I always teach my students at Baylor is that for the runtime of the film, it deserves your full attention. Uh, those of you who are here in the room will have an easier time of that because you're trapped. You know, because the snow is now probably up to the eaves outside. <laughs> uh, but for those of you watching at home, I just want to invite you to, to give yourself completely to the film and to try and take all of the other distractions away for the time that you're watching it. Um, so we, we have this tendency now to multitask in every piece of our lives. It's actually what I'm preaching on tomorrow. Um, but the, the attention that you pay a film like this will pay it itself back in, in a multitude of ways. So just that reminder, this is uh, uh, something worthy of your full attention. The film starts when it starts and it ends when it ends. Uh, you have been to the theater and gotten up when the end comes on the screen and everybody leaves the theater. I'm one of those people who doesn't leave the theater uh, because in a thoughtfully made film, even the closing credits offer an opportunity for reflection. And so um, what I encourage people to do is to stay for the whole film. It starts when it starts, it ends when it ends. And then finally, the last thing, um, those of you who are watching at home, let me encourage you to watch on the biggest screen that you can. Um, movies are primarily visual. They communicate in a lot of ways, but they mostly communicate through images. And there are a bunch of thoughtfully chosen images and beautiful and startling and difficult images in this film. And the, the bigger they are, the more immersive they will be. We're watching on a big screen um, here at St. Paul's, and, and I would encourage you not to watch on the smallest phone that you can find. Just that, that thought. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to say a tiny bit about James Baldwin, uh, who is uh, one of the great guides of my life, and then uh, set up a couple of questions, three actual questions, to be thinking about as we watch the film, either here in person or in uh, whatever place you, you may be watching. Um, how many of you are familiar with James Baldwin, have read a book by James Baldwin, or know a little bit about him? So this, this is probably preaching to the choir as uh, we say in my tradition. Uh, but James Baldwin is one of the great American writers. That's one of the first things that I always try and communicate about him. Uh, I teach James Baldwin a lot. I teach, teach Spike Lee a lot. And often they are reduced by putting an adjective in front of their names. Uh, James Baldwin is not a great black American writer. He's a great American writer. He's one of the greatest writers in our history. Um, and uh, Eric was kind enough to say that I am somebody who writes in a lot of different forms, but I am no James Baldwin. Uh, Baldwin wrote great novels, great critical commentary, uh, great essays. Uh, he wrote a stage play or two. He wrote a screenplay about Malcolm X. Um, and all of them are brilliant and beautiful and uh, events his love for words and his uh, growing up in the church, um, although he left formal religion. All of us know you don't ever really leave those things behind there in your blood and in your bones. Um, Baldwin is a person who took on the idea of life as a witness. And uh, so one of his primary tasks that he set for himself, both in the art that he created and in the life that he lived as an activist, um, was this, this job of, of being a witness to history. 
And he does so, I think, thoughtfully, as we said, beautifully. And um, so I want to just sort of call your attention to the fact that this is, this is a film that is set up with James Baldwin as its sort of filter character and that, that central concept of witness. What do we see and how do we tell the truth about it? So here are the three questions that I'd like to suggest that we return to, and we can talk about anything you want to. We'll spend 30 or 45 minutes after the film, um, or if we are all actually stuck here for the rest of the day, maybe longer than that. Uh, but, but here are the three questions that I'd like to encourage your attention to. Uh, one of the things I know from years of teaching is that I could ask you a ton of questions, but three is about the most I can hold of anything in my head. Um, my wife will tell you, if you send me to the grocery store for more than three things, I will not get one of those things, but I will also get two things I wasn't supposed to get. So three will be the numbering, no more and no less. First, this movie is oriented around the idea that James Baldwin wanted to write a book about three martyrs he had known personally. Um, Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So one of the central questions for me about this story is, what did he expect that those three lives would teach him in the journey he was gonna go through as a writer? And what did he hope that having them bang against each other, as he says he wanted them to do, their lives bang against each other, would give to the audience, the readers, that he would present this story to. So Malcolm Martin, Medgar, what is it about the three of them that we can learn from? Second, we mentioned that Baldwin is the filter character for this film. How does James Baldwin's life and how do his writings, uh, and both his writing and speaking are, are uh, copiously uh, testified to in this film? What do they teach us about history, race, and culture? And then finally, the last thing. Um, this movie is about a book that Baldwin wanted to write and never finished. Uh, it was something he wanted to work on toward the end of his life. That's some decades ago now. And so this is a story that is of a moment, but it's also very clear that it's of this moment. So I guess my third question, my final thing for us to think about as we watch, and again, anything else that's of interest to you that you want to bring uh, to this body, we will welcome. How does the movie allow us to engage with the past in a way that illuminates our present? What does it have to tell us about what has happened that might help us understand what is happening right now? So those are the things. There will be other things that come up. Uh, I'm gonna take notes for the umpteenth time and I will learn some new things as we watch. Um, so for our folks at home, uh, we're getting ready to start the film here. And as we said, it'll be a 94 minute runtime. And uh, I think we've got a countdown as, as we come back in. Yes, this high tech world. Uh, so folks at home, you can expect that we will uh, sort of count you back in as we get ready to have uh, our conversation here. And if you've got questions or comments, as uh, Eric said, we would uh, welcome those from you at home. And again, thanks to all of you who are here in this space today. I'm very excited about having this conversation with you and hearing what you see in this film, which I love. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> And uh, so we have about 30 to 40 minutes for, for discussion and, and conversation around this very emotionally affecting and thoughtful piece. And um, Greg will, will be here to engage with us. I will have this handheld mic. And so I will uh, walk around and pass the microphone around uh, for anyone that has any comments that you'd like to make. And for those of you who are uh, tuning in from home, um, I will be keeping an eye on the chat in, in the Zoom uh, uh, screen so that, and, and so I will read your question out loud to the group so that you are uh, able to engage uh, with us as well. So um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Greg and he will restate the questions that he asked at the beginning of the uh, film and, uh, and get us going on our conversation. So, great, thank great. you, Eric. 
All right, um, so welcome back, those of you who have been watching at home. Um, I hope that you uh, have uh, had a good experience up to this point and were able perhaps to uh, take a look at the film uh, during our, our time watching it here. Um, and again, thanks to all of you who are here, and thank you to George for feeding us today. That is one of the most important things that people do. Um, so uh, I hope that you will find yourselves fed in, in several ways this afternoon. The, um, the three sort of large questions that I wanted us to think about as we watch the film. Uh, first, the concept that uh, Baldwin was explaining to his agent. I want to write a book about these three men who I knew and loved and lost, and that we all lost. And uh, so the first question was rotating around the question of what did this do for him? What did he imagine it might do for him? And what did he imagine it might do for us, those who might read about or learn about uh, those, those lives later on? So that first one was related to the, the question of why Malcolm, Martin, Medgar, and why at that point in his life did that become something that he wanted to, uh, to address? The second thing, we uh, talked a little bit about Baldwin's life and career. Uh, you probably noticed, because we sat through the opening and closing credits, uh, there is a lot of Baldwin gathered from all over his life and career um, that's put together in this film. And so the concept of the film is around the 30 pages that he wrote for Jay Act and his agent. Uh, but there are bits and pieces from uh, a number of his works, and of course, as you saw, the ongoing references to the Dick Cavett interview, a famous Dick Cavett interview, and to the Cambridge Union debate that he had with William F. Buckley in 1965, one of the most famous uh, encounters of American intellectuals, like a Super Bowl of debate in Cambridge in 1965. So our second question was, how is it that the filmmaker, Raoul Peck, takes the life and work of James Baldwin and helps us to understand something about ourselves and about um, the culture, the, the history of race in America and in the world um, through using Baldwin's life and career. And then the third thing, uh, I was thinking about this because it came up in my Facebook memories this morning. Uh, there were protests in Ferguson, um, Missouri, uh, seven years ago today. Um, and uh, we saw some images from Ferguson, from some of the Black Lives Matter, early Black Lives Matter rallies in Ferguson. Um, and so our, our third sort of large question was, this clearly, because you know, Baldwin uh, conceived of this uh, some years ago and has been gone for some time, is a story that is of a moment. But Raoul Peck clearly believes that everything that Baldwin has to tell us about that moment relates to our present moment. And uh, this is a film that I've been showing since it came out. But uh, over the last five years, I have no reason to think that it doesn't continue to speak just as powerfully to our current moment as it did uh, when, it, when it first appeared. So those, those were the three kind of large areas that I was hoping we might look at. There are other things that I'm sure have come up for you. And I actually like to begin conversation about a work of art with what uh, Eric was talking about, the sort of affective realm. I know that some of you have seen this film before. For some of you, it's the first time seeing it. For me, I've seen it a number of times, and yet I still find myself very powerfully emotionally affected by it every time I see it. So before we lean into that question, I want to begin our conversation just by returning to one of, um, I think, my favorite phrases in all of Baldwin. And this is something that I've talked about with other people uh, who I love who do this work of uh, trying to wrestle with race in our culture and other cultures. Toward the end of the film, you will remember the, the narration. And uh, the phrase from Baldwin is this, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And one of the most powerful things that I think happens when we agree to come into a space and deal with these issues and watch a film like this and in subsequent weeks to do the same thing is that we are agreeing that we are willing to face those things and to begin to have hard, good conversation around them. So that's, that's where I wanted to begin, just simply with that really powerful statement. Um, because so much of this film features Baldwin talking about either 
ignorance or willful ignorance on the part of many people in, in our culture. And um, so that, I think, is a, a really important thing for us to, to say, I am willing to face this and to think about where that facing might lead me. So here's where we wanted to start. As I said, I'd like to hear some experiences. Uh, those of you seeing the film for the first time or maybe having seen it before, a section of the film that you found particularly emotionally affecting, that struck you in some way that you are still kind of reflecting on. Is there anybody that'd be willing to share um, a moment in the film or an experience of watching the film today uh, that was a powerful moment for you? Yes, right here. Um, the point at which, it's on. Okay, when he says, the, I think what he was saying, that the difference between the North and the South is the method by which we castrate black men. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there is, um, as Eric told you, I'm working on a book on racial mythologies. And there's a very powerful racist myth in America that we see expressed a lot in this film about the lost cause. And I was raised in the Deep South. I went from kindergarten through fourth grade in schools in Georgia and North Carolina. Um, the, one of the two fist fights in my life was over the lost cause. Um, one of my classmates called me a damn Yankee. And I didn't know exactly what that meant, but clearly it was supposed to be the worst pejorative that they could offer. <laughs> and so there I am in fourth grade, wailing away on my best friend underneath the monkey bars for reasons unknown to me, but having something to do with that myth. But there is a corollary myth to the lost cause. Um, one of the things about the lost cause is it says, well, you know, slavery was not that important, or if it did matter, you know, it was mostly good, you know, mostly beneficial for the people who were a part of the process. Um, there's, a, there's a tendency on the part of the lost cause myth to deny slavery as an essential part of American history. And it's something, you know, speaking of, you know, past and present. Um, in Texas, where I come from, um, it's a state where they are passing laws prohibiting public schools from talking about race, from talking about slavery as a, uh, a primary organizing force of American history. Um, but the corollary myth that I wanted to mention to you is that there is a tendency for people from other parts of America than the American South to think that they are not in some way implicated. So last week, um, perhaps some of you know, I was uh, doing a workshop at Trinity Church Wall Street, uh, the wealthiest church in America, literally on Wall Street, the wall of Wall Street was built by free and enslaved black people. There was, at the end of Wall Street, on the river, a slave market. And a couple of blocks away from Trinity Church Wall Street, many New Yorkers don't even know this, there is a national monument. It's a grave, uh, a burial ground for 15,000 free and mostly enslaved Africans in New York City. So some blocks away from Wall Street, you know, the symbolic home of, of American wealth and power, we have this, this monument commemorating 15,000 people, most of whom were brought forcibly against their will. And uh, so we can talk about all sorts of economic connections between North and South, uh, but one of the things that I think this film simply reminds us is that slavery is an essential part of American history. Even if we feel that we, people who look like me did not directly benefit from it, which is something I often hear from people who look like me. Um, there is no denying this, this fact that, that Baldwin is saying, you know, black history is American history. And uh, so that's, um, I think, one of the really powerful things um, that you bring up is just that this is, uh, it grips us to uh, be confronted perhaps, by, by some of these realizations and, and revelations. Could I, I hear from a couple of other people, uh, a place in the film where you were, where you were touched in some way, um, or stricken? Um, there are places in the film that I feel stricken. Yes. Thank you. I, I, I bring it up just because it was related to what you were talking about, but I, I wrote down at one point that the history of racism in America isn't linear because it isn't until like halfway through the film that the filmmakers start including a lot of images about slavery when they maybe when they first start focusing on Uncle Tom's cabin 
We've yeah. already seen a lot of images of segregation in the 50s, and it, I think, is still challenging to me to realize it's not like we start with, you know, the colonists and the, or you know, and then and then we have the slave trade, and mm -hmm. then we have the Civil War, and the, I mean that is the chronological events, but it. I think the film helped reinforce that for me that these like it it matters it's not it it really just debunks the myth that like well that happened so long ago and what matters now is you know sure there's still police brutality but that doesn't have anything to do with slavery or something like that I know and and because the film early on is uh, talking uh, Baldwin is talking to Dick Cavett you know about how far the black man in America has come I mean, uh, that's, you know, one of our questions was, you know, past, present, you know. Um, I think that uh, Raoul Peck very much wanted us to circle back and ask, you know, what, what sort of progress have we made? How have things changed in the, I don't know, 40 years maybe since that interview was recorded? Um, and I love that you, you, you're saying it's not linear because that's the way we're typically taught. Um, and uh, often when we think about race in America, there are like two or three or four kind of significant things. There's slavery, and then there's Reconstruction, and then there's the Civil Rights Movement, and then Barack Obama. <laughs> Hooray! You know? And um, one of the things that's been a, a huge part of this work I've been doing over the last six or seven years is just recognizing how much that leaves out. Uh, so, for example, Henry Louis Gates has an amazing book and a, a great uh, TV series about the period of Reconstruction called redemption, which is a beautiful word with a horrific meaning uh, because it's about the moment when uh, the southern states decided that the black people had been given all the freedom they were ever going to be given, and it was time to redeem the way that the South had run up until the Civil War. So redemption is Jim Crow laws, it's uh, lynching and violence, it's uh, systemic and individual persecution and, and degradation. Um, we don't always hear about that because uh, Reconstruction is often taught as this, you know, sort of, uh, here's the 15th Amendment. And uh, from here on, it's, it's clear sailing. And um, I mean, one of the obvious things is you look at uh, Confederate monuments and uh, statues and things like that, they're not placed right after the Civil War. Many of them are placed in the early and mid 20th century as a way of reinforcing this ideology. The daughters of the Confederacy, bless their little hearts, as we say in the world where I come from, bless their little hearts. And I mean that sort of figuratively and literally. Um, have won the battle for America's history. And it is only now that we're starting to see those, those monuments come down, um, that those, uh, those are being revealed as tools of racist oppression. So um, I, I love that uh, we're, we're kind of recognizing that and leaning in that direction. Can we hear one or two more? Yes, please, over here. And we're doing this partly because Oprah does it, and also partly so people at home can hear. Um, there were two things that really struck me. One is um, when they showed the Rodney King video, yeah. uh, because when things happened at Ferguson, and people were saying, we're finally seeing it on video, I'm like, what? <laughs> this is, you know, you know it, we've had pr proof. It, so obviously, that's not the thing that was missing. Um, and then the other was the refrain of Christianity, about the Christian church being part of the problem. Um, and it was really striking to me that it's the Christian church, it's not Jesus. So it's the way that we've interpreted and um, taken all the power out of that image of turn the other cheek, uh, where it was initially meant to be, you know, if you turn the other cheek, the person has to then strike you with the other side of the hand. That means that they are treating you as if you are a human being with dignity. Mm -hmm. um, and we have stripped all that power out of it, much as um, our society has tried to strip all the power out of 
black men as, as they were showing in some of those images. Good, and, and I'm sure we'll talk more about Christianity and its role, both uh, positive and negative, in this. Um, we mentioned that Baldwin had been a preacher in his youth, and apparently a really, really fine preacher. I cannot imagine that he wasn't uh, with his gifts. And you notice how even though he said, I did not belong to a Christian community anymore, I mean, he still uses rhetoric and images and I mean, all those things, you know, he's, Dostoevsky, Henry James, and the King James Bible. I mean, that's, that's, you know, if you did a like, you know, a little Venn chart, you know, with the intersecting uh, circles, where is James Baldwin? It would be right, right there. Um, so this, this whole larger question about Christianity and its failure, largely, to deal with this. Um, toward the end of Frederick Douglass's autobiography, uh, he has talked about Christianity all the way through the autobiography, and, and I think this is very similar to what Baldwin would say. Um, Frederick Douglass says that what he has been talking about throughout the, the, the work is slaveholding Christianity, which he said is not Christianity at all. And it reminds me of something that my friend and colleague, uh, Kelly Brown Douglas, who's the Dean of our Epis Episcopal Divinity School, uh, one of our greatest theologians. Uh, we were doing a program at the National Cathedral a couple of years ago before the pandemic. And uh, it was a program on, on history, race, and the church. And I remember her saying um, that slaveholders introduced slaves to Christianity, but they did not introduce the slaves to God. And again, it's that slaveholding Christianity, which I think there are still a lot of vestiges of. Um, and we can maybe talk a little bit more about that as we, as we lean into some other questions and discussion. Um, one more, anybody else with an emotional, yeah, an emotional response to the film? Thank you. Two, two tracks I have for, for my answer. I'm also freezing cold. <laughs> And my, um, one, in terms of response to him, uh, <clears throat> the, the last conversation with the black moderator, when his emotion just washed out of him and all of that passion and energy, and I, I often thought, not just at that moment, yeah. but that he was just going to break down and sob. His eyes were fluid and, and um, every ounce of him was filled with that message. But, you know, my other response is, is um, a response to me. We have a group here at church who's been studying anti-racism and reading books. Wendy's part of it um, for, what, a year, year and a half. We've been doing this, and, and um, it certainly has changed my life. And I mean, some of it's been horrific stuff to read and hard. But I watched myself, the, the kind of spiritual superiority coming over me. Mm when um, I love that Cambridge um, test, that, that you know, oratorical contest, and I get all into it and say, yeah, yeah, we're telling you, and, you know. So I, I, it pushes me into an arrogant posture, which is never, of what use is that? And the other, and, and I could see it, I could feel it, a couple, and I said, so Helen, there you are. It's a, it's a lesser form, it's a lesser degree, yeah. but you have that same, there they are, here I am, and I'm right. Yeah. You know? And so it, it's, um, you know, the human condition, I get it, I know that. But um, boy, there it is, one more time. <laughs> so yeah, I love that you brought that in because there, I, I used the word difficult uh, when I talked about the conversation that we were gonna have here. And there was a person of color at Trinity last week who said, you know, I appreciate the fact that these are difficult conversations for you but you have the option of having them or not having them. And that was such a powerful reminder for me because she just said, you know, I can't get through my day without having to reckon with the color of my skin. And you don't have to do that, which of course is absolutely true. So I, I, I love that reminder that uh, we are stepping into this place of vulnerability and, and willingness to listen to ourselves and, and what might be happening with us. The way I've been talking about this lately with groups of people who largely look like me, um, 
grows out of something that I've heard our uh, Dr. Catherine Meeks say, who's the, the head of the Absalom Jones Center for Racial Healing in Atlanta, one of the leading lights in Episcopal life for racial healing. And she says, guilt and shame are not useful emotions. And where I've sort of landed on this, especially after conversations with her, is the idea of conviction. Uh, in the Southern Baptist Church where I grew up, you know, we were, we were convicted of the Holy Spirit. But the whole idea of conviction is that it does more than just make you notice a moment. It makes you notice that you need to change. And so one of the things that, that's really important about this conversation today about the films that I've been showing that you'll be watching, they are in a, a moment for engagement and an opportunity for engagement, but they're also an invitation to continued engagement. And this work that you all have been doing for the last year and a half, I'm, I'm so pleased to hear about it. Because um, the other thing that Dr. Meeks often talks about is she says she doesn't use the word reconciliation anymore because white people want to leap immediately to that. It's like, you know, we were just talking about Barack Obama, elected president, now there's no more racism, hooray. And so what Dr. Meek says is that um, people who look like me need to be reminded that this is an ongoing, lifelong process. Mm -hmm. And as she said uh, at a conference that we had at Baylor two weeks ago, I do not expect to see the end of it. And yet it also puts me in mind of that line from Hamilton, which I got to see last week with my daughter, fourth time, um, you know, about planting a tree, you know, planting a seed that will become a tree, and you'll never live to see it. But um, that, that for me is the profound nature of this work and kind of turning in that direction uh, because that's, that's the very powerful part of conviction. You know, in the, in the Christian tradition, there's a, a word in the New Testament, it appears a lot. Um, it's metanoia, is the Greek word. And uh, it's, 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 it's a word that talks about 180 degree change. You know, uh, about our becoming different people and seeing the world in a different way. And, um, and, and that's what conviction can do and where it, it can lead us. And so these, these moments for engagement and opportunity and seeing ourselves and, and where we are at this moment, I think are, are super valuable. Do, do you mind if I chime in? I would quicker? love for you to. I, I just, um, I was just thinking about metanoia and I think that that is one reason why I wanted to do this film series during this season of Lent. And I think it's a real gift to our, uh, to us as Episcopalians and liturgical Christians that we have this season yeah. that is dedicated to looking our frailty and our shortcomings right in the face. I mean, that's what Lent is all about, is to, you know, remember that we are not perfect. And I think Lent uh, really flies in the face of the concept of the myth of progress. And, yeah. uh, and last week, I, this, my sermon that I preached was when I was a kid and I, and I first heard the great litany, um, I thought, God, this is so medieval, you know, um, you know, f plague and famine and pestilence and, uh, you know, war and, <laughs> you know, all this stuff. I mean, this is all stuff that happened, you know, in the, in the medieval times. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, I, I said, I, as I've said in my sermon, uh, um, growing into adulthood, I realized, no, this is what it means to be human and live in a fallen world. And um, yeah. some of my favorite theologians speak about uh, racism as a America's original sin. And I think it's important for us to, to put, put racism in a theological context and to, to, yeah. and to look it in the face just like we look our own frailty and mortality in the face as, as a part of that um, metanoia, a part of that turn that we do every year during Lent and, and should do every day in our own faith life. Yeah. And, and I want to make an observation, which um, I'm sure is apparent to all of you as well. But, you know, we're, we're talking today largely about white on black racism. Uh, but I've been working with a lot of people who have been talking about just the simple fact of the white Christian American myth. 
Um, and it's normally not just uh, toward people who look like me, but uh, guys who look like me. And uh, there, there are a lot of toxic American Christian men talking into the culture at this moment. Uh, perhaps the most visible American Christians are these people. And um, it, it's very clear that their exclusion extends to everybody who is not them. And, you know, so I, I want to be very clear that there is all sorts of ex exclusion. There is all sorts of marginalization. Uh, this is what I'm drawn to because I'm a child of the Deep South and because this is the first hatred and, and bigotry that I experienced in my life and witnessed. But um, it's also true that, uh, you know, if you're a person who loves differently or looks differently or lives differently than many of these folks, then you're still going to be marginalized and thought of as less than they are. Uh, so it, it's about caste, it's about hierarchies, um, and it's about, I mean, honestly, about the fear that they have that they are losing their place of privilege. And that's, it's, it's a reason. It's not an excuse. But it is a reason. So we've got three pivotal figures that, that Baldwin wanted to think about and to write about and to, you know, talked about, you know, have, have their lives, you know, bounce against each other in, in ways that certainly we see in this film with, with King and, and Malcolm X, less so with Medgar Evers. But what does, what does Baldwin's interest in these people um, in Malcolm X, Medgar Evers, and Dr. King, allow him to reflect on in terms of his own life or the, the life of the nation. What did, what did you observe in the film that, that this does for him as a project? It's like five questions. Any of those questions. <laughs> My students will tell you this is what I did. There was a, a thread in there in the beginning when he seemed to suggest that uh, uh, the project would put him in contact with the children that were left behind. Yeah. And I guess the project wasn't actualized, right, because he died. And I, I'm understanding that. I don't, you, you implied that I, I, the project was never fully realized. Yeah, it was, right? it was never completed. Okay. And I, I think it was one of those things that, I mean, he did leave unfinished, but I think also he gave it up. Oh, interesting. Okay. Did not know that. Well, yeah. just interesting that, that uh, it, it, he seemed to be interested in that opportunity, but also, of course, part of that journey he referred to. Yeah. I thought it was very interesting because um, you almost got the sense that he was both curious and afraid of what he might experience um, hearing from the children. At least this was my mind. Was, no, I think that I was, think you're was, hearing was wondering. You're hearing accurately. I mean, there's that that line from the movie where he says, you know, you it's, it's called a journey because you don't know where it's going to take you. And um, I mean, for those of us who want to maintain a rigid control over our lives, a journey is like often the last thing we want. Uh, in the archetypal hero's journey that, uh, that Joseph Campbell wrote about, there is, there is a, a necessary stage, which is denial of the call to adventure. Because it's like, no, I don't want to go on an adventure. I am fine right here in my little hobbit hole, and I'm just going to have breakfast and second breakfast and whatever it is that comes after that. I'm very comfortable not having to change, because that's what a journey does, is it changes us. And who knows, as Baldwin says, who I'm going to be on the other side of this. I also really like the fact that you brought in the children, this sort of uh, generational thing, which we were talking about, past, present, um, and that, that sort of encounter with these, you know, these embodied figures of their, their father's life and history. What else? What, what else did you notice that, that we get? And we've got a couple right here. This is, this is so helpful. Thank you all. I just thought <clears throat> he probably did it because he also wanted to uh, have closure. I mean, these were his good friends, and obviously it happened at, um, too early in their lives, and he has never really dealt with this. 
till he finally decides I need to go home and I have to make this movie, whatever scene, in order to get closer, I guess. That's yeah. And, and I, I like that fact because I, I think it also is sort of have, have we as a nation figured out what these people meant and what their deaths meant? And so that, that larger question, you know, him personally, and then, because it, it, it does seem that, you know, part of that job of bearing witness is like, I, I'm going to take this on, but, it, you know, it is the hope of every great artist that your individual story is also a part of the larger story and it helps other people understand their stories. I mean, that's, that's why we tell stories. Um, do you feel like he achieved closure in the time he was working? No. I see some heads shaking. Yeah. What else? Well, I was wondering along that line, um, I don't know enough about Baldwin to know, did he ever make a, a statement about whether he was more on Malcolm X's approach or King's approach and, or whether he found things in both that yeah. could be drawn out in you. I, I think he found things in both. I, I think that he was also on this journey that he was talking about King and, and, and Malcolm X being on. Um, and, and, you know, he pointed out that, that for, there was a stretch where he was sort of the great black hope for white people. Um, because, you know, here is this, you know, smart, articulate, I mean, you know, uh, brilliant man with this, I mean, I mean just the, the whirling brain. Um, as I look at the work from later on in his life, it feels to me that he has lost some of the hope that he had mm -hmm. early on. But it doesn't feel to me like he ever lost the idea that love is the only thing that can change things. And so I think, at the end of the day, he still ends up on, on the king side of the ledger. And um, I mean, you heard him say it's, it's a good thing that, you know, that black people don't want revenge. So I mean, I, I think that he understands that, that rage. Um, but from his early career through the late career, it does feel like that, that idea that love is the only transformational possibility is, is going to put him in, in King's Corner. Thank you. Good. Uh, although I, I also thought it was interesting that he said that ultimately King and Malcolm uh, grew together, you know, and, and, and ultimately sort of landed in the same place. I thought that was a, an interesting yeah. observation that Baldwin himself makes, um, that they transformed one another. Um, yeah. Um, how many of you know much about Malcolm X? Anybody? There, I mean, there, there tends to be a dearth of, of knowledge of, about him. He's so interesting and, I mean, such an amazing life. And, you know, Baldwin is pointing out how differently their lives developed. I mean, you know, Dr. King was a product of the, the black middle class. You know, his father was a pastor, his grandfather was a pastor. If you've ever been to Atlanta, the neighborhood where he lived is, you know, it's the nice black neighborhood in Atlanta. And uh, so, you know, so, so King came from, you know, good roots and, and uh, had all of the advantages. And Malcolm X didn't. He went to prison, he struggled, he scrambled. He found a philosophy of life and wrestled it into something that, that worked for him. And ultimately, as, as Eric was saying, he ended up moving further away from the, the black Muslim idea and more toward something about love and, and equity. Um, and it got him killed. That's what always happens when you lean too heavily into love. It's going gonna, it's gonna to put you in danger. Um, let's think a little bit about Baldwin now. Those of you who have read him or know a little bit about him, some of you are being introduced to him today. What is it about him as a person, what is it about his life that we think maybe led this filmmaker to say, this is a project that I want to give years of my life to putting together? What was it that Raoul Peck saw in Baldwin's life and words that he thought, this will make a necessary film? Thank you. 
to me, he's like a, he is like a Christ figure. He carries <clears throat> the rage. He carries the pain. He carries the, um, not the water down, but the actual rigor of the experience of, of, of a black, his brothers and sisters. He carries it. And uh, he doesn't carry it to resolution, though. I mean, this talk we're having about was he more ex Malcolm X or was he more uh, King? I think you know he carried both, as we as has been said. Yeah. And I think that's a hard position. It's it's that liminal role, you know. The, oh, that's uh, who, who was it? Um, Brooks wrote about that. David Brooks about people who are liminal and how a hard position that is. Because not only do you see both sides, but you carry both sides. And one can't be defended over the other. And I mean, his, his whole sensitivities and his, um, the capacity for suffering as a consequence that he had, that I think uh, is remarkable. And I think it's, um, I mean, engaging doesn't touch it. Yeah, that, I love I love no. that word liminal. Liminal. That does seem to be the place that he stands for us, in, in our culture. And let's see, was there another hand over here? Did I see? Yes. But there are a couple things that struck me about about him when he was when he was describing uh, that he was belonging to any of those central organizations, and why. Yeah. I found that very interesting. Um, uh, it seemed to put him um, as an observer participant in some ways. So he was inside, but he observer was participant outside. Yeah. Which that whole idea of observer participants is sort of interesting for this. Well, for anything, but for this problem, I think it was really interesting. I I think uh, there was this to me this subtle thing about what his class was because I noticed that at each of the events of uh, where he was at the time the figures died, he was, um, he was in a safe place. He was in Puerto Rico. Yeah. He was poolside in California. He was dining with his family. Um, yeah, at a, you, at a you nice restaurant in London. Right. You wonder whether there was some, he had some ambivalence also about him being out of the fray too. Yeah. On the one hand, it was a safe place for him to write. On the other hand, he wasn't on the front line. I mean, all of these things just Yeah, that's, that's so nicely put. Things I just w wondered about, that's all. I don't know. And, and what you to know, say those, about those references to Paris, um, I do, as you all probably heard, I, I have a sweet gig in Paris. Um, how do you get it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I, I spend a lot of time following James Baldwin around Paris. And, you know, I, I sit in places where he sat and I drink where he drank. And, uh, I'm sure wander <laughs> places where he wanders. Um, and there is, on the one hand, this, this freedom that comes from that. And, and for him as a black gay man, I mean, there were so many things about the America of the 1940s, 50s, 60s, where, I mean, not only would he not have been welcomed, but his life would have been in absolute danger all the time. Um, so he, he has, in a sense, the freedom to be in a safe space and do his work. And, you know, he, he talks about it. you can't sit at the typewriter when you're dealing with the existential fear that you could die at any moment. But he says that also is the essential piece of the black experience that white people need to understand. And that's actually one of the most important things that's grown out of the last few years of doing this work for me. Because I, I think... I'm a person who tries very hard to be very cognizant of my privilege. And I'm still getting smacked in the face all the time. So let me, let me tell you a quick story. This is one of my favorite stories from the last few years. I do a lot of work um, with Van Newkirk from the Atlantic Monthly, um, Van uh, Newkirk II. Uh, he's senior editor of the Atlantic. I think he may be our James Baldwin, maybe the greatest writer on race in contemporary America. Um, he is a small black man, dark skinned. Um, his hair is all over the place. Um, we have very different life experiences, but I did not realize how different until we were doing an event together at the National Cathedral. Uh, Corva Coleman from NPR, God bless Corva Coleman, was our moderator. 
And as was typically true of a program like this, I was like the single white face on stage, which is exactly how it should have been, because I've got my lived experience, they've got theirs. Uh, but we had just screened Do the Right Thing in the nave of the National Cathedral, which was awesome. Um, and after it was over, Corva was leading our conversation, and the first thing that she asked was she said, Greg, could you tell us about your experiences with law enforcement? I didn't realize she was gonna ask me that question. I have actually a substantial number of experiences with law enforcement. <laughs> and my wife, Jeannie, asked me always to let you know that they do not extend past my teenage years. I do not have a felony conviction. You know, nothing has been expunged. Uh, but I, my parents moved from the Deep South to a town in Oklahoma where there were no people of color. They did so very intentionally. And so I grew up in my driving years in a, in a small town where I knew all of the police officers by name. There were three of them. And unfortunately, they knew me by name. <laughs> and every weekend, if they managed to catch me, they would pull me over and they would make me open my trunk and pour things out into the ditch. <laughs> Never once in my life, in the multiple times that I had encounters with law enforcement, did I fear for my life. And, and that was the realization that I was having on stage in front of a nave full of people. It's like, I was worried about my beer. <laughs> and then Corva turned to Van, who was sitting next to me. Van, who is a national treasure, whose brain should be in the Smithsonian in the far distant day when he leaves us. And Corva said, Van, could you tell us about your experience with law enforcement? And he puts his hands out in front of him. And Corvus says, can you explain for the audience, which was largely white, can you explain what you're doing, Van? And Van said, I'm putting my hands in plain view on the steering wheel so that I don't get killed. And I was just like, all right, there it is again. I thought I knew some things and there's still so much I don't know. Yes, ma'am. On this token, about 12 years ago, I forget, when my son graduated from college, obviously he's a white guy, and they had a job, but then the job fell apart because of, I guess, the financial crisis. <clears throat> so we parents said, oh, why don't you take a road trip, the three boys out west, and come back? So I have this friend who is a black woman, so I said, oh, and her son was also graduating from college. So I said, oh, what is he doing? She said, oh, what is your son doing? I said, oh, they are going on a trip. She looked at me and she said, we cannot do that. Yeah. And I still, I mean, to this day, Kelly Brown Douglas is a friend of mine. I mean, we're not dear, dear friends, but I know her husband, Lamont. I um, met her son, Desmond. And it was Kelly who first made me realize that there was an essential distinction between black families and white families. Uh, when we first began talking about doing this work together, and I had to audition for it. And the reason I had to audition for it is because many of the people of color I know are so tired. And it requires so much vulnerability on their part for them to open up about their lives to another white person. And also, frankly, I heard from a, a white uh, professor of homiletics at Howard University when I called to make his acquaintance. He said, I don't think I want to talk to you. White people only ever call me when they want something, when they think that I can be of use in their agendas. I said, that must be pretty awful. So um, it was two years before Kelly and I actually became friends. And I would email, and she wouldn't email me back. And what she was saying to people at the National Cathedral, by the way, was, who is this white boy from Texas? And why does he think I want to talk to him? <laughs> That's a fair question. But once we started talking, she was telling me about the talk. Now, in my family, what was the talk about? <laughs> yes, it was. OK, in, in white families, middle-class families, it was, the talk was about reproduction and how not to. And please don't, you know, the talk that we're having with my daughters. Um, and she said, that's not the talk in black families. 
the talk in black families is how do you go out into the world in such a way that you don't threaten someone and get yourself murdered? And in speaking particularly about law enforcement, I mean, imagine that. That this is a conversation that, that you have to have. ta Coates writes about this and how he had, had to have the talk with his child, his son. So as we think about past and present, which is the last thing that we wanted to lean into, and we don't have a whole lot of time, we're always going to run out of time for these good conversations. What does this film remind us? So let me ask this. I will actually focus my question in this way. What has changed and what hasn't as we take a look at this film and what it has to tell us about race in America? What has changed and what hasn't? I answered that, but I also want to just say quickly in reference to your previous question that what is amazing about him is, is how fierce he is. He kept going. Um, and oh, that Yale I philosophy mean, professor? Oh, yeah. That was just a bad day for him. Oh, that was, but it's just, you know, here he was, this skinny little gay black kid. And he just, I mean, like, he kept at it. It's amazing. It's as if, like, the ever-ready bunny inside him that just kept him going. He needed to speak to people. He needed to communicate. And it's so impressive because he's this little guy, you know, this, like, and you just think he could be so crushed by all the experiences of his life and yeah. the people like him. But he didn't, he wasn't, and he kept going. And I just, I, I think it's amazing how he kept his composure. I mean, even though there were times when he was speaking, and, but, but having watched the full Cambridge Union, you know, with Bill Buckley doing his usual Bill Buckley thing and being all grand and, you know, yeah. la, la, la. And, uh, and the fact that, 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 that Baldwin was able to just keep his composure and keep his thinking clearly and be able to speak logically in the face of such ridiculousness. So, uh, so anyway, that was my... But I, I, so then jumping back to the current question, I mean... I think it's amazing that the film was made as long ago as it was because it is so current. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't there, didn't I? We see a Black Lives Matter f poster in there at some yeah. point. So I was like, that must have been way early on. Yeah, for Ferguson. Year, yeah. You know, that, that it's so prescient uh, in terms, of, I mean, horrifyingly prescient because it's talking yeah. about things that happened mostly in the past. Yeah. Um, but little did we know that it was going to stumble upon, and we have taken this horrible backwards turn. So it's, yeah. it seems absolutely pressing and current for today. And I, sadly, I'm, I'm glad to, to see that. I'm not glad for the situation. But I mean, we need stories that speak to us in the present situation. And I, I'm, I'm pleased to know that this is one that still seems to do that. That certainly has been my impression watching it and screening it. Um, anybody else? What, what has changed, if anything? And I mean, yes, here and here. Oh, I should no? also add that I've been remiss that we have a few comments on chat. So okay. I'll, I'll, uh, after we have some opportunities to share, I'll, I want to bring in our virtual participants. Yes, absolutely. The main change I noticed was that we did let a man, black man be president. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, and uh, I, I don't know if it was on uh, RFK's timetable or not. It was about, it was about that. Yeah. You know, um, just a just a quick meditation on that though. I remember I I worked my first job out of college. I was a parish administrator at a at a diverse Episcopal church in. Um, Washington, D.C., and it was the year that Obama was running for president, and I had a Bible study with several middle-aged black women and me, and we met every Wednesday for this Bible study. It was, it was wonderful, and I, I had this um, moment um, 
in which I said, aren't you all so excited about, you know, Obama's candidacy? Isn't this so exciting? Isn't this a great moment for our country? And they each looked at me um, with kind of almost like a look of pity um, and said, you know, we're afraid of what might happen uh, if this happens. Yeah. And um, I think in some sense, uh, I, now I know what they meant. Um, yeah, there's, there's a great moment in the TV show Black-ish, and you all know that I study religion and culture and race, and, um, and, and, and basically the main characters are saying exactly that, and they're just like talking to each other about how terrified they were when Barack and Michelle were walking down the street. And, and uh, Anthony Edwards, I forget his, the actor's name, but uh, the, the lead character says, because I was just afraid they were gonna take it away from us, like they always take it away from us. I just want to say to that, uh, I had that same terror uh, at the inauguration, and they didn't end up taking him away from us, but they did end up taking essentially any power away from him. I mean, he was unable to enact any of his domestic policy. Yeah. And I think it's widely believed that, it's, uh, that it was a racist uh, power that kept him from, or, or animus that kept him from being successful. So I don't know that we've actually succeeded there. I mean, the horrible thing for me here is uh, we talk about history not being linear. This film and the whole thing makes me think it is just cyclical. We just keep coming yeah. back to the same <clears throat> horrible situations that we have. You look at the Watts riots in 1965, you look at Ferguson, you look at uh, Detroit last year or Minneapolis yeah. last year, nothing's really gotten better, I don't think. Yeah, and I think one of, just speaking to that, and we're gonna come back here and then we're gonna take some things from, from, from home. Uh, Ibram Kendi's great book, Stamped from the Beginning, which is the history of race in America, history in the West, really, because it goes back to Prince Henry the Navigator, uh, where you start getting uh, white European people saying, well, we've got to come up with some rationale for uh, taking these slaves from Africa and holding them as slaves forever. Um, but you know, if you have read that book, which won the National Book Award for History, it, it, its thesis is essentially maybe not circular, like cir circular or cyclical so much as um, wave-like. You know, because we are all deep believers in the quotation that Dr. King used to say about how the the arc of the moral universe is long, but it trends tends toward justice. And so, you know, it is, it is possible for us to, to write what we think is a linear history of race. But Kendi says it's not a true history because there is action and reaction. We elect a black president. That's an amazing thing. And then we were talking about those people who find that threatening. Their power, their privilege, their economic status, everything. And so there is this incredible pushback. And so we have, forgive me, the most racist, outwardly racist politicians in my lifetime on the, the public stage now. It, and it's a direct reaction to the wonderful thing that happened, to that, that moment of liberality and movement. Um, but I also will say that reading Kendi's book actually made me feel hopeful that this isn't simply going to go backwards, because we also see people of conscience saying, this can't stand, this, this racism, this bigotry, this you can't uh, talk about people being gay in Florida schools. Anyway, don't get me started, because we're actually supposed to be stopping. Um, yes, back here. And then, uh, Eric, you're going to bring in some of those conversations, and then maybe we'll finish up. Um, I was just thinking about um, connecting the past and the present with some images that struck me from the um, movie. So um, the images at the end of just portraits of colored um, people, and then comparing that to one of the things that struck me was when they were showing 
the riots, and then they would flash on an image of a, per a black person who looks so relatable. Um, and then contrasting that with the first person black woman, she didn't look very young, who was going to school. Yeah. And like those images kind of stick with me and I think that um, illustrates some of the timeline. But I do see progress there. I mean, I think that that's where, um, I mean, I think that's one of the challenges with changing people's perspective and when yeah. you see someone you see a portrait and then what do you how does how does that message like how do you feel about it and what's your reaction good and i think just in cinematic and story terms we're also seeing those images at the end those beautiful black faces as a response to the stereotypical images from advertising that are in the the movie early on the you know sort of bestial images um, and and also some of those images from the protesters you know, I'm equal, you know, and you've got these, you know, horrible sort of bestial images of black people. Um, and then the contrast here. Um, if you haven't seen it, let me commend to you Spike Lee's Black Klansman, uh, which is a film that I show a lot and uh, discuss in situations like this. There's a beautiful scene toward the beginning of that film where a black activist is speaking to a group of students in a community uh, and uh, community people and is talking about black power, but it's, it's about black beauty. And what Spike Lee does is something very similar to what Rao Peck does at the end of this movie. He shows these amazing, beautiful black faces. You know, shows their dignity and their intelligence and, and, and their beauty. And um, so on the screen while they're talking about black beauty, he is doing these, you know, sort of, he's zooming in on these faces. Um, it's, it's, again, a, a film that, that feels very much of the moment, um, and many of Spike Lee's films, unfortunately, still are very much of the moment. Um, but I, I am so glad that you brought those images in, because the first time I saw this film, I was like, how is he going to end this? Where can we possibly go that would feel like hope? Because that's what we need. We know the history, and we look out the, the door, you know, and past the snow, but we see the world as it is at this moment. Where is the hope? And, and that's a beautiful way. And in those faces, he's showing us the image of God. Yeah. Yeah, precisely. That's what we proclaim. Um, we have some uh, uh, comments here. I'm seeing some, uh, uh, Renee Wolkett, uh, she says, uh, as someone who grew up in North Carolina and lived in Charlotte for a year before moving to PA, I was struck by how little I was confronted by the racist past and present of my home state. I had never seen the footage of the young woman integrating a Charlotte high school before, and I did not know how separate but unequal schools in North Carolina were until I conducted some oral history interviews as a young journalist. Wow, thank you for that. That's, that's amazing. Um, and then uh, Renee continues, uh, white people like myself are still hugely capable of turning a blind eye to the lived black experience and holding fast to our safety and profits, as Baldwin said. Yeah, that's a startling phrase. Yeah. And then Nicole Tullo uh, says, was his desire to write about the three key figures of the movie a warning that his will that this will or could happen to all people of color. Mm, that's nice. Well, let me say just a couple of words of conclusion, and then, um, Eric, would you like for me to offer a closing prayer, or would you like to come up and do it? Please, okay. go for it, Greg. I, I, would, I would be happy to do that. As George was saying, this is a film which is five or six years old and yet feels like precisely of the moment. And we said that's both a good thing and that it continues to speak to us and it's a bad thing and that we continue to need to be convicted. Um, I was speaking of Spike Lee earlier. I've been showing Do the Right Thing since 1989 when it came out. And one of the things that is heartbreaking to me is that there has never been a time that I've shown it. I usually show it several times a year in different settings, sometimes in classrooms at Baylor, sometimes in churches, sometimes in universities. 
There has never been a time when I have shown it when a young black man has not recently been killed by a police officer over 33 years. Um, and as I said, that is, that is a heartbreaking thing to have to realize. And there's a part of me that says, I don't want to show this movie anymore because nothing's ever going to change. And then there's a part of me that comes back to that saying from Baldwin. If we don't confront it, if we don't put it in front of our eyes, as our, our uh, person listening from home was saying, if we put it out of our mind and sit in our safety, those of us who have it, safety and profit, then why would anything ever change? And so a story like this one, stories like you're going to hear in the film series over the next few weeks, are essential, particularly for people like me, to expose myself to and to expose other people who look like me to. Um, I want to thank you so much, those of you watching at home, those of you present here today, for coming in and doing this work and um, confronting this thing. And um, when Eric and I were talking about this, I talked about how this needs to be wrapped in prayer. Um, because the human reality seems so daunting, and yet the scripture tells us that with God all things are possible. And it puts me in mind of that wisdom from the Jewish tradition. Pray as if everything depends on God. Act as if everything depends on you. And so we'll close today with our prayer for social justice. Again, thank you all for coming. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who created us in your own image, grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression, and that we may reverently use our freedom, help us to employ it in the maintenance of justice in our communities and among the nations, to the glory of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you so much. Um, I look forward to seeing many of you tomorrow, if that thing is possible. <laughs> and um, please, please be very safe, because as I said, this seems to me apocalyptic, given my knowledge of weather. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much for, for braving the weather, and thanks to all of you for uh, taking your Saturday to join us at home, and um, we'll see you tomorrow for church, either virtually or in person. <laughs> Bye.